Hi, everyone. Uh, great to have you here. It's a bit of a smaller room, um, but that's OK. Um, I'm Jan Fines. Um, I'm working on Hyper since 2011, so that means before the acquisition even. Um, now I'm a manager in the Hyper team, and yeah, I try to continue making Hyper the best it can be. Um, a short um, disclaimer, this talk, we had this talk every year since 2016. It was called something like turbocharging hyper, turbocharging tableau, something like that before. So it might be that if you were here the last years that you might already have seen this talk under a different name. Of course, I changed some slides, but it's like 80% the same. So I don't want to bore you. So if you have already seen the talk, of course, you're always free to leave. Um, OK, to give you some context, um, Hyper is the, as of today, is the data engine behind all Tableau products. That means Tableau, desktop, server, online, public, Tableau prep. Um, that was not always the case. Uh, before, we got introduced in Tableau 10.5. The, the old data engine of uh, Tableau was called TDE. You may, may still remember. Also, the extract files were called .tde and not .hyper back then. And our job, our first job, was to replace that engine. And I have here this plane because, think about it, we had to replace the engine of a plane while the plane being midair, right? Because Tableau was running. Everything needed to keep running. Tableau Online was working, right? And then at some point, we want to do the switch from TDE to Hyper. So, that was not super easy, but now it's a few years ago now, like two, two and a half years ago. And now we're in, everything's running fine. So the, the mid-air engine replacement worked fine. Um, but now what is, what is Hyper, right? And why, why did we want to replace the, the TDE with Hyper? Um, I'll start with a small timeline. So that's a nice city of Munich where Hyper was and still is being developed. Um, in 2008, uh, we started at a re as a research project at the Technical University of Munich. We had a lot of academic su success. We had like 40, 50 papers, a lot of best paper awards, a lot of uh, invited, invited uh, talks, stuff like that. And so then we found a commercial spin-off because we developed Hyper as something that could be a real, become a real database one day, right? And most of research is done as a throwaway prototype, but from the beginning we developed Hyper as something that could one day become a product. So we created a spin-off, and then in early 2016 we got acquired by Tableau. Um, Tableau, they promised and they kept their promise to open an R&D center for us in Munich, right? Because we were based in Munich, and we said, like, we want to be here. Some of us already had families. We, we want to stay in Munich. So say, they said, OK, we'll open up a new office just for you guys um, in Munich. And that's what they did. Uh, we started with three people in that office. Pretty cool. And now we are over 30. Um, in 10.5, we finally. You, um, 10.5 was, I think, end of 2017. So after about two years, we were done with our mid-air engine replacement. And we launched 10.5 with Hyper. Of course, when Prep came out, we were also the data engine behind Prep. And now, this year and in the future, we have new interesting stuff coming up. So this talk is more important for you than ever before. Because now with Hyper API, which will, I will also talk about, um, we give you direct access to Hyper. So that's awesome, right? The last years, I always had to say, like, yeah, it's cool, but you cannot work directly with it. Just use Tableau, and in the back, it will use Hyper. Now I can tell you, yeah, you can work directly with Hyper if you wish to. Um, we have cool new features coming, like encryption at rest, user-defined functions, adaptive compilation, stuff like that, all of which are in different stages of development. Some are more the experimentation research stage. Others are like encryption and rest are almost or are in the product. Um, and we still try to stay as close to academia as possible to stay on top of the game, right? Because the database world, especially with new emerging hardware, it moves. And we want to be on top of that game. So we still have uh, three professors um, 
as, as advisors at Tableau, and we have like eight PhDs in our team. They all are PhDs in database system, right? So we have a very strong academic record. Um, so now what is Hyper? Hyper is a high performance next generation database system. We have designed it with core, four core principles in mind, which is it's one system operating on one state, making no trade-offs and no delays. So what does that mean? One system means Hyper is one general purpose database system that combines transaction processing, data ingestion, and data analytics, right? Before you had these, you had your data warehouse, you had your tra transactional system, we said like, no, you want that all in one system so you can have the latest data right at your fingertips. It operates on one state, so it's not like, we could have said, yeah, there's one hyper system, but it still has somehow a data warehouse state and a transactional state, and then you do internal ETL cycles inside, Tableau, in, inside hyper. That's also not what we want. We want to have one state where the transactions are operating on and where we do analytics on you, so you always have your latest data. What we also didn't want to do, what a lot of other modern database systems do, we didn't want to have trade-offs like a lot of systems these days, they don't give transactional guarantees or they don't ha no longer have SQL. They just have stuff like MongoDB. Oh, it's just, it's just a key value store and we don't guarantee you so much and therefore we can scale super, super well and be super fast. We said, no, we want to keep with, we want to be fast and efficient, but we want to give the user all they knew from their traditional database system, transaction guarantees, asset, SQL support, all that stuff. And finally, when we want to have no delays, which means we want to scale as much as possible with your hardware resources and have the best performance we can have on all possible workloads. Um, so what does it now mean in the, in the context of Tableau? Um, you know Tableau, you know your visits. How does it interact with Hyper? So if you see a whiz like here on the left, and what does it mean when you create an extract we pull the data into Hyper, and then Tableau issues queries. Tableau under the hood builds SQL queries and sends them to Hyper, and Hyper gives you the answers. This is how these, uh, how these products interact. Then we have prep, right? You have a prep flow like this one, and what happens behind the scenes is, is like 90% of that flow is launched in Hyper. Also what you see here, these results, they are all returned as results from Hyper, prep build SQL queries, sends them to Hyper, and Hyper answers. Since 10.5, we had the following customer impact. We gave you advantages in speed and size, having analytics on like bigger data, big data sets, query performance that scales linearly with the number of CPU. And this is important, right? Because the number of cores in your CPUs, it goes up and up and up every year. And you have to make use of these cores. Otherwise, it's just dead metal. We also have data freshness, beta, better data freshness, because we can create extracts faster and re, therefore also refresh faster. We have no post-processing, what the old TDE has. Maybe you remember back in the days, your data was ingested and then it was a phase something like preparing or sorting data, which could have, again, took, taken you like minutes or hours. That, that phase no longer exists with Hyper. And we're enterprise ready. We have improved scalability and performance and therefore give you more bang for the buck on, on Tableau Server especially. We still don't just sit on our laurels. We still try to invest heavily in performance every year. So this vis shows you we had a set of workbooks where Hyper was slower than TD, right? Our goal was to be fast on every conceivable workbook, but of course from the millions of workbooks that exist, some were still slow in TD. And we tracked that. So you see in this vis 10 workbooks that we tracked, and you see it's normalized to one. So this means one is how fast TDE was. So for example, for this workbook, Hyper in the beginning was like twice as slow. Here, higher is worse, right? Because it's time, it, it takes longer. But these are then the versions since 10.5, and you see over time we made it better. And now we are with this workbook almost as fast as TDE. With this workbook we were way slower, now we are twice as fast as TDE. With this workbook we were, I don't know, five times slower, and now we are almost as fast. So we're still investing heavily in performance. And it goes on. You see this ends at 2018.3, so this is from last year. This 
If I would show you now with this with 2019 for or 2021, it might be even lower. So now that we talk about speed, like the question that Pat Hanran, co-founder and chief scientist of Tableau, um, asked once at a keynote at an academic database conference is why are databases so slow? That was back in 2012, and it was true. Databases but dropped that slow. And that turns into the question, then, why is then hyper so fast? And one of the reasons is modern hardware and what it means for database systems. Right? Because the hardware landscape is changing. And databases are very old, right? Things like DB2, they existed for decades. That means their whole architecture is built in a time where, for example, main memory, that's main memory prices over time, where, where one terabyte of main memory was not possible, right? Where, what was it there, like $50 per, what is that, per megabyte. Yeah, so if you want one gigabyte, you pay $50,000, right? So it was all disk-based, right? You didn't have big, big uh, main memory. Now we have very cheap main memory. You see this? this stops already at, at 2014. It's also not the latest data, so even now it might be even lower. So we have huge main memory capacities, so we should optimize our databases for that. You see here's the comparison. It's really, it's orders of magnitude cheaper, right? It's just um, Moore's law. The same with CPUs. That's now CPUs, um, again, the uh, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis are different metrics, like the number of cores. You see, the number of cores, you, you still remember till 2005, we only had single cores, and then it went up, right? Um, number of transistors, Moore's law still holds, goes up. And this is log scale, right? So this linear growth is actually exponential growth. And, but of course, the, the frequency in megahertz, you see that, that, that we have a plateau, right? It cannot get faster, otherwise you get problems with physics, right? Your, your, your power cannot move, it just moves with speed of light, and if you make your clocks faster and faster, at some point it cannot travel through your chip anymore in one clock cycle. So that plateaus, but now the number of cores is going up. So you need, there are new challenges, right? You need to handle all these cores. So the traditional database systems that were built maybe here, they were, of course, not uh, optimized to that. So for database systems, it means the following. This shows you, this is a figure from an academic paper. It's not our paper. It was from a fellow research group. Um, it has nothing to do with Hyper. They showed their uh, database system on ADB X100 at the time. You see it's from 2005. It's not even really new. But this partially answers the question, why are database systems so slow? So what they measured is how much time it takes for a specific query. And they, they, they showed that DBMSX, MySQL, the traditional systems, it took like 20, 28 seconds. It was very slow. Then this is already a better system that they devised, and, and it's like three seconds already way better. And they're the best systems. What they proposed at the time was 60, 0.60 seconds, right? So orders of magnitude faster. But they also included, they wrote a hard-coded a C program that only executes this query, right? No database system trusts a C program that executes the query. And the strange thing is, they, nobody questioned, well, how can it be? That's the fastest that very clever people in the world can come up with, and a C program is still faster. How can that be, right? This is like years of research, and this is, yeah, someone sitting there and, and hacking C and still being like factor three faster. So this is what we asked ourselves with Hyper. If a hand-coded program can beat all the database systems, why can't our database just generate that program? Um, so this is what we do. Hyper compiles each SQL query to machine code and then executes this code. So we somehow write the C program. We don't write C, but we write something that is machine code, right, which also C compiles to. So we do somehow that. But this, of course, there's no free lunch, right? So there are some drawbacks to this approach. With traditional interpreting systems that did not uh, generate code, you had an interpreter which uh, has to handle all possible queries. It had to be very general. 
and therefore it could not be adapted for your specific query, right? You cannot do like super specific optimizations because it has to handle everything. With Hyper, of course, it's highly specialized to, to the query at hand. We can hard code stuff into that program and therefore it's very fast. But with an interpreting system, you can just start executing right away. With the code generation approach, you first have to generate that C program or whatever program, then you have to compile it to machine code, and every one of you who has ever compiled C or C++, you know that takes, you start your compiler, you wait some seconds, and then it's done, right? Um, so this takes time. And we solved this problem partly through a lot of work. We solved this by, we don't compile to C, as I said, we compile to our own intermediate representation. Think of it as, is it something like assembler, but, but tailored, we build it ourselves, so it's specifically tailored that it's fast to generate and fast to do optimizations on. Then we start interpreting that intermediate representation in our own virtual machine, which we also wrote ourselves, and we measure, oh, how long does it take? We start, we start execution, and if it's super fast, if your query just returns one result, we don't bother, we don't compile the query because your execution just takes 0.1 seconds, why should we, or even less, 10 milliseconds, five milliseconds, why should we bother compiling? But if you see that it takes longer, it's not done after 10 milliseconds, then in the background, we start compiling the code to optimized machine code, and once the compilation is done, we swap it out in flight again, um, and then the query continues executing on the optimized machine codes. It's a bit too like what modern languages like Java or so do with a JIT compilation, but we had to build it all ourselves to be as fast and efficient as possible. So why do we do that? I mean, it seems like, yeah, that whole compilation thing is nice, but why didn't the databases do that 20 years ago, right? I mean, compilers existed back then, right? Why, what, are we more clever than, than our predecessors? And the answer is no. Uh, it was just not attractive back then, and it's attractive now. And I want to show you this with this latency pyramid. You might have already seen it if you're, if you're interested in hardware. This is how long it takes to retrieve data from a specific location inside your machine. If the data is in a CPU register, it takes like one CPU cycle, so a few nanoseconds. Level one to level three cache, it's like four to 40 cycles. You see we are already getting a factor of 40 slower than registers. RAM is like 200 cycles. And disk, a spindle, is like 40, 40, four to 40 million cycles. So we're getting a lot of orders of magnitude slower, right? And to show you how this, yeah, we always see these big numbers with, with computers, right? But to show you how super, super bad that really is, I want to show you an analogy. It's like fetching the data from memory. Think about it as getting a document in the real world from, from, for example, from this table, right? And one CPU cycle, so in one cycle I can walk three feet, right? And then processing the data is then reading that document. That means, for the analogy, the document, if it was stored in CPU registers in the real world, it would be lying directly in front of me on my desk. With level one cache, it would be in a bookshelf close by. Just a few steps, I can get it, right? Uh, level two cache would already be in the next room. It's getting a bit yeah, cumbersome to get it, but still no big deal. Level three cache, it's in a neighboring building. Now it's getting really cumbersome. RAM is one block away. That's bad, right? If I just want to read a document and I have to walk one block to just get it and then read it in like 10 seconds, that's not good. But now we come to disk and you can, you can do the calcs yourself. This is not exaggerated. It would be exactly at the other side of the earth. And I have to walk. In this analogy, I don't have a car, I don't have a plane, I have to walk. So if I have to walk one time around the earth just to get a document to then just read it in 10 seconds, then it does, it's absolutely, it does not make a difference whether I read it then super fast by generating code or whether I read it super slow by interpretation, right? All day, I'm just waiting for the data to get from my disk. And therefore, the database systems were optimized for this. So they, they put all the brain power in how can we make it that we don't have to go around the earth all the time. We couldn't keep the documents in our bookshelf because we, we our bookshelf was that small, right? And we had a lot of books. And therefore, pr 
efficient processing was absolutely irrelevant. But with modern hardware, um, we have now more memory and we optimize for keeping the data as far up in this pyramid as possible. We even with our code generation, we try to avoid main memory and try to stay in registers as much as, much as possible. So we really try to keep the data on our desk. And now, if I read it slow by interpretation, right, I have the interpretation of what, this really hurts because the data is already in front of me. So now compilation starts paying off. But compilation, the whole new hardware thing I just told you, is not the only thing. If you build a database system that's just tuned for latest hardware, you will be very, very slow. Because there's also this thing called query optimization or logical query optimization. The word logical meaning it's not, it not, does not care about hardware, it cares about in what way you execute your query. Um, this this shows you different ways to execute the same query. Every bar is a way to execute that query. And you see um, the y-axis is time. Again, it's a log scale. And you see um, the fastest way to execute this specific query at hand takes 10 milliseconds. And you see there are some fast ways, but there are also some super slow. And we even, we stopped here. We stopped at three seconds. It might be that these even run longer, that these run minutes, hours, or years. So by executing a query, it's mostly join ordering. You have a big query with a join tree. And I can tell you one thing. Tableau generates humongous queries with hundreds of joins, group bys, a lot of that. If you execute that in the wrong order, it could be a difference between 10 milliseconds and 100,000 years. And then, of course, if I pick the execution order that takes 100,000 years, it doesn't matter whether I optimize for modern hardware, right? I have already lost. So I have to have an optimizer that tries to pick these fast plans. Okay, but now what's the problem with that? How well do databases do that? The problem is that query optimization is inherently hard. Hard in two ways, computationally hard, it's an NP-complete problem. If you do this, um, uh, for example, the join order is, is NP-hard, and there are some other very hard problems. And it's also hard for humans to reason about. So it's hard for machines, and it's hard for humans. Therefore, only real experts can write good query optimizers. And therefore, many existing systems lack various good optimizations that would be good to have. And only very few researchers in the whole world specialize in query optimizations because it's such a tough, tough area. It's so tough to make, get good new results. There are way easier areas like JSON, NoSQL, whatever. So this is where everyone jumps on, right? Uh, but this hard thing, only very few people do. But now, why is Hyper now good at optimization? The good thing is we have Professor Dr. Thomas Neumann He's a co-founder of Hyper. He wrote most of Hyper, so he's not a, only a good theory person. He also is a very good coder. He's still a principal advisor at Tableau, and he's one of the few people that specialize in query optimizations in the world. So we're just lucky there from a personal, from a personnel perspective, right? We have one of the few people in the world that specialize in this topic. Next thing, parallelization. I showed you before, I showed you this viz with the course now going up, right? And it didn't end there. Today we have 100 core machines. We have, soon have 1,000 cores, right? And Knight's Landing has a huge number of cores. It's not even the latest one, right? There's even a neuron. So I'm, I'm not in picture what the latest CPU is and how big it is, but it's huge, right? It's not like these 16 cores that you see here. It's, it's way bigger already. But these cores are only beneficial if you can leverage them. For example, if you have a software or a database system that's written single-threadedly, right? That's, if you do programming, that's the easiest way to write a program, just a single thread. But then, of course, you can only leverage one core. Traditional systems, they do some kind of parallelizations, but I will show you why these don't scale to a lot of cores. They could, for, in this example, use four cores, but not all 16 cores. And Hyper can use a lot of cores. We tested it with, with 120 cores. It can leverage all of them. Why is this the case? Again, 
It's not rocket science, it's, it's not magic. I'll tell you why this is the case. Well, maybe it's a bit rocket science, but not magic. Um, and the thing is, let's have an, again an analogy with cake. Assume you have a cake and you want to eat it as fast as possible, right? That's always the goal with cakes, right? Um, you have four people. The people are your cores that crunch your cake. And you want to have it as, far, as fast as possible. So how do you do it? The first approach that many people, many families would do, and it's bad. Don't do this with your family if you want to eat a cake as fast as possible. You just, if you have four people, you cut it into four pieces and everybody just starts eating a piece. Why is this bad? Some reasons. What if a person is slower than the others, right? Your kids might not be as fast as you in eating, or maybe they're way faster, right? And maybe some of, the, some of the pieces contain some nuts where you really have to chew along, or I don't know, a piece of chewing gum, or is that in cakes? No, probably not. Um, or one piece, you know, it's, it's easy to, to cut a cake with, into four pieces, but once you have five pieces, it's really hard to cut five pieces that are equally uh, large. Or maybe someone's distracted, the phone is ringing, and then that person in the end will eat alone, and the others have to wait, right? So this, is not, this approach is not good. This means in the hardware world, that's bad CPU utilization. And we have more stuff, like, you know, with, with today, with... Um, the cloud, where we have like, oh, people, we have scale, automatic scaling. People or cores arrive after we started the query processing and they still, they want to participate or someone has to leave. You, your thread is used for something else by your operating system. Well, how do we handle that? That's a problem. Um, we don't have load balancing elasticity and we call this problem, we call it skew in database systems. Skew is when, I, t I wrote it here, if one person is slower than the others. We first thought they would be f as fast, but one person is slower. And this really hurts, and I will show you this with, with Amdahl's law. You see this plot, it shows you on the x-axis the number of cores, again, log scale, um, and on the y-axis how much speed up you get if you can paralyze only a portion of your query or any task. This is a general law. It is a mathematical law. It has nothing to do with database, but of course a query is, is one um, usage of this uh, law. So you see if like 95% of your query are parallel, that means only 5% are not parallel. So that's the best case in this, in, in this chart. Your speed up is kept at 20x. Even if you throw 65,000 cores on the problem, you're kept at 20x. And if you think about it mathematically, it makes sense, right? Because 20x, 100 divided by 20 is 5. That's exactly the 5% that, that is not parallelized. So these 65,000 cores, they are all waiting while the single core is processing these 5%. And that means if we don't parallelize all tasks, uh, all parts of uh, parallelization, then scalability will be limited. And this is a really hard limit. I can never get faster than 20x, even, even if I have one trillion cores. The more cores you have, the more you want to utilize, the better you must parallelize. You also see this in this chart. If we only, let's say, have four cores, let's see the, 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 the green bar, four cores, we, you see we receive like uh, 3.8 times speed up. So if you only have three, four cores, then this 95% parallelization is still good enough, right? 3.8 out of four cores, that sounds good, right? But once we have like more, it gets harder. And what has, this, has that to do with skew? Think about it, skew forces part of the task to be not parallel. We said the last person eats alone. That's exactly the problem. And this is really bad. See here, 95% um, parallelization, 32 cores, means only 13x speed up. That means only 40% utilization. So if we at Hyper build Hyper in such a way that it only can, that it handles Q in such a way that it can only parallelize 95%, it would mean if you put Hyper onto a 32 core server, you only get like 40% of that course. You paid for 32, but you only get 13. That would be really bad, right? So this, does not scale with modern CPUs. With four cores, still okay, eight cores, still okay, but with modern many core CPUs, no longer works. So what does Hyper do now? Hyper 
cuts the cake into very small, we call them morsels, and then everyone grabs such a morsel whenever he or she finishes their current morsel, and that means, for example, a faster eater simply eats more of these morsels, a slower eater eats less. And if these morsels are small enough, then all eaters finish roughly at the same time. That means we are resilient against skew. We don't have this problem. We can get 99.999 whatever percent of parallelization, and we can scale to 120 or more cores. We have also have more good stuff about that. For example, if a tastier cake becomes more becomes available, we can switch directly to that cake. So we can do query prioritization or stuff like that. If the numbers of eaters of per cake changes, we can also change that dynamically, right? If someone else joins, they just eat a new morsel. If someone leaves, yeah, they just have to finish their very small morsels, then they can do something else. So why don't now existing systems do the same thing? The problem is, it's a software architecture problem. You have to build your architecture of your database execution engine in such a way from the beginning that it can feature morsel driven. You cannot first build your execution engine with this old model in mind and then add morsel driven parallelism afterwards. It doesn't work. You would have to change the architecture of your whole database system. That's why um, traditional systems don't do that. And this is not a theoretical thing. This is real. I can show, this is the same query executed on the, on the old Tableau data engine, which you see on, on top right, and on Hyper. And you see the old data engine. It also tried to parallelize, but still the traditional way. And you see in this example, it only can, it has 27, that's percent. That's a Windows task manager, right? Or resource monitor, however it's called. And it only can do 27% CPU utilization, while Hyper is at 99. So this is a real thing. OK, so far about performance. You see, more than half of my talk is about performance, because really that, that's what mostly matters, but that's not the only thing. We also want to do more than analytics. As I told you that in the beginning. So we want to trend. We had this one state thing, right? We want to have transactions and analytics on the same state. Traditionally, you didn't have that. You had your transactional system, right? Then you had your analytical data warehouse, and you had these ETL cycles, which were first, maybe, first they were maybe hourly, then they were nightly, then, oh my god, they take more than 24 hours. We have customers like that. We have to do them weekly, right? And then your, your data is one week old, because you have it takes so long to get it into your data warehouse. And then you have this new stuff, graphs, key value, data mining, Hadoop, NoSQL. We call it beyond relational, right? It's, it's a different kind of data. And it's yet another system that if you want to join the data with, with your OLAP, with your data warehouse, oh, you have to somehow get it into the same system. And this is cumbersome, right? What do we want with Hyper? We want to have all things on the same state. Currently, we're still at the above two, uh, at the upper two. So from the beginning, it was built that it can handle OLTP and OLAP at the same time. We have not invested heavily into that beyond relational thing yet. We just did some initial measurements there, because it's just not a big customer ask at that point. Um, but of course, that's still, it Hype is designed in such a way that this is still possible in the future. If we have customers asking for it, we could add that. So now that I told you Hyper can't handle that, think about, I want you to think about why this is hard. Because you might ask, OK, having a data warehouse and a transactional system in the same system is so much better, right? I always have the latest data. Why doesn't everybody do that? And to get back to real life, to make an analogy, cards. Think about it. Again, we have, you want to do an analytical query on cards. For example, in a stack of cards, you want to count the number of aces. And while you do this, someone's doing transactions, someone is inserting cards or pulling cards out of the stack, and you still have to tell me how many aces are in there. And they could be, they could be inserting aces or pulling out aces, or, or they could be inserting not aces. You don't know, and you have to, this is hard, right? You have to somehow come up with a mechanism that you know which cards were there when you started, and then the person inserts cards. And also, if you think about it in a hardware perspective, they all operate on the same memory. You have to make sure that they don't 
ruin your memory and stuff like that. So this is really hard. But hyper, yeah, we, I will not go into detail here how we solve this. Uh, it's called multi-version concurrency control and some more stuff. Um, you can read our papers. But how, what could we do if we could handle that? And we can. So the vision, of course, is to have exactly this data at your fingertips thing, right? That you could stream data into hyper. You know, right now, hyper extracts. But that one day, you could have a live connection to hyper. You update the data in the live connection. And immediately, your vis changes, right? You have an event coming in, something new, and immediately, bam, you see it in your vis. This is, of course, the goal where we're aiming at. And with Hyper, at least from the back-end side, we have a technology enabler to do that. OK, to recap, Hyper is the next generation database system. It can do extract creation, extract refreshes, federation, and Tableau prep. I didn't mention that, for example, federation, right? How do you do that? How do you join between two databases? The answer is hyper. We pull the data into hyper and do the join in hyper. Then we have the analysis part, right? It's used for dashboards, interactive analysis, ask data uses it, explain data, all under the hood goes to hyper. All the cool features that were shown to you in the keynote, somehow in the end, end up in hyper, right? And one day, we could have this deep analysis on other data types. And now, finally, I want to talk about Hyper API. Hyper API, that's our new thing, right? That's the game changer why I say this talk for you is more important this year than the years before. Because now we give you the tools to leverage Hyper directly. Um, what is it? It allows you to harness this Hyper's power because it allows you to connect to Hyper directly. You can insert, update, delete, and read data from your extracts, from your .hyper files. It's available in Python, .NET, Java, and C++, and it's for free. Um, you can get it today. So, and really, this is one of the few, where, where, few things where I don't have a link in my, in my book, uh, bookmarks, but I just remember the link because it's really easy. See it? It's tapsoft.co slash hyperapi. So if you want to get it today or just browse the documentation, tapsoft.co slash hyperapi. Tapsoft.co slash hyperapi. You remember? OK. Um, so what is it? Um, of course, it's an API. So you have to write code, right? This is something for the programmers among us, or the scripters, or the data scientists that already do Python um, hacking. You have your client code in your application, and it communicates with the Hyper API front end. The front end is what we have different in each language. So we have a Python front end, .NET, Java front. This front end under the hood um, talks to a back end, which is a DLL, a shared library. Um, so this is already optimized machine code, right? So you might know like Python is slow, but we do the, all the heavy lifting under the hood in a DLL that's very fast. And this spins up a hyper process. So this is the real thing. This is hyper that is also used by Tableau. And you now can now spin it up yourself and create SQL connections to a hyper. And hyper then issues these connections on the database files. So you now have direct SQL access to hyper files. Think about it. This is huge. You can read data from extracts. Before, we had a lot of customers that said, Extracts are data sinks. Once the data's in, I cannot get it out anymore. I can visualize it in Tableau, but that's it. If I need it in any of my other tools, it's gone. Now you could use hyper databases as also a means of getting data back. And since we support SQL, you can do also complex analysis of it. You group by, join, window operations. We have a plethora of SQL. You can look it up, tapsoft.co, hyper API. There's a documentation of our SQL dialect, which is pretty close to the Postgres dialect. Um, of course, it has to be super mighty because it has to also to be able to handle all these huge queries that Tableau sends us, right? This is really the same thing. We'll not give you a small version of Hyper. This is the Hyper that powers Tableau and Prep. Um, you can do these update things. 
Also not possible before. Delete data from your extracts. We have stuff like a rolling window use case, right? You only keep the latest data in your extracts. You delete data that's, let's say, older than a year. You add data that's newer. You can do updates. If you see an error in your, in your data, you could change rows. That was all not possible before. Now with Hype API it is. Um, we have partners using it. Alterix uses it um, for, for their product to create and read extract files. So this is huge. We'll give it out for free. But just a disclaimer, right now it only works on your local machine. So right now it cannot change extracts on Tableau server. If you want to handle extracts on Tableau server, you first need your, our REST API to download them, change them on your machine, and then re-upload them. Almost any customer asks me, yeah, but I want it on Tableau server. And we see that. But this is just the first iteration. You know, We released it one and a half months ago. So this is brand new. We see that you all want it on Tableau server. Uh, I cannot promise you when this will come, but, of, but at least I can promise you we know that you all want that, and that, of course, makes it somewhere high on our priority list, right? With that being said, so this is, you can now leverage Hyper directly, tapsoft.co, Hyper API. With that being said, um, I'm done for today. Um, the good thing is we still have like 20 minutes left for Q&A, um, but before that I wanna shout out for the other sessions that we have. Please don't believe these dates. Look it up in your app because these dates frequently change. I put them in two days ago, so it might be that they are already no longer um, up to date. So we have some more talks about Hyper and especially Hyper API. So this was the deep dive research theoretical talk. We have a lot more practical talks that show you how to use it. First, we have Hot Hotter Hyper, how to handle big data. That's a talk by our salespeople. It, it tells you how to handle really big data with Hyper in a layered approach. Um, then we have performance best practices for hyper extracts. That's from our hyper developers. They go through some cases where a customer had a performance problem and it was really their own fault. They did something that you should not do and they will talk about what these things are. And then we have two breakout sessions about hyper API. My talk was only about hyper, I just made some advertisement for Hyper API, but we have talks really about Hyper API. First, we have automating data connectivity to solve real business problems. So this is a very practical talk. It shows you how can you use Hyper API to solve real problems. Then we have turbocharged extra creation and modification, a technical introduction into the Hyper API. I will be doing that. Um, this is really a technical telling you what it is, how you can use it. And then for the even more practical people, we have a lot of hands-on trainings. We have two trainings from beginner to advanced and advanced to expert. And this is no longer up to date. We no longer have two repetitions, but we have a third one because everybody wants to have these hands-on trainings. So you can still sign up for the third repetition of these. Um, they are, because it sounds like, yeah, this is a prerequisite for this one, right? Because this brings you from beginner to advanced and this from advanced to expert. That's not the case. You can also, but this shows you really more the basics of the API. And this one shows you how you can use the API plus the REST API to interact with Tableau Server. So this is more the whole use case, how to do it on Tableau Server, and this is more a basic how, how do we use the, the Hyper API. So if you're interested in everything, you could very well have both, or for example, if you can make it to this one, only that one, that's also okay. This is not a prerequisite. And finally, please fill out the survey in the mobile app. We're always happy to know what we could do better with the talks. And now that we jump into Q&A, I wanna say thank you for listening to me. And one more thing, you can meet me and other developers from the Hyper team at the Tableau Showcase in Data Village. There's a booth about um, APIs and SDKs where we also talk about the Hyper API and we have always people there, it's always staffed. So just stop by, talk to us. If you have an idea how you could use the Hyper API, if you have further questions, I will also be there if I'm not giving a talk because I, many of the talks I showed you I will be giving, so I will not be there too, too often because I'm just here talking all the time. <coughs> oh God, my throat will kill me at the end of the week. And yeah, with that being said, thank you so much and now we can go into Q&A.